recording this session. Uh, it's recording the screen in my voice and yours if you shout loud enough. Uh, and I obviously don't have all of your email addresses, but uh, I'll upload this to YouTube and I'll pass the URL on to uh, David and then he'll mail it all out to you. So uh, for those who want to share this with their grandchildren someday. <laughs> So Dave it asked me to talk about Vim and Unix and cool stuff involved with that. Also to answer any questions you have on your homework. Um, I'm happy and willing and ready to talk about any of that stuff, but I'm also happy, willing, and raring to go to talk about any question at all you have, uh, whether it's about esoteric C++ stuff or my wardrobe, just... just just let them come at me. I won't, I won't answer them all, but you can ask them all. <clears throat> so, let's start with you. Ask me a question. Stump me. Give me something that I don't know. What is Vim coded in? What is Vim coded in? Um, it's either C or C++. I do not know which. Nice. I already stumped you. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I narrowed, it down, I narrowed it down to multiple choice, so, so half credit for that. <laughs> What else? So you all know everything up to this point. You have no confusion going on at all. Yes? Um, what do I do here? I am uh, a on the tenure track. Uh, for those, I guess I'll, I'll just talk about it generally since uh, when I was in college, I didn't understand how it works. When you're hired into a university as a faculty member, everyone generally is hired as uh, what is referred to as an assistant professor. And you are, uh, I guess they kind of call it a probationary period. And they call it tenure track in that an assistant professor is trying to reach tenure. And that's a seven-year process. Once you reach tenure, you're generally promoted to an associate professor. And then uh, any time after that, although it generally is uh, at least 10 years, you can then go up for full professor. So look carefully at all of your instructors, what it has listed. So if it has assistant professor listed, that doesn't mean that they're an assistant to a professor. That just simply means they're earlier in their career. <clears throat> so I, uh, I actually got my undergraduate degree here. Uh, in fact, let me see. This will be, it's, it's worth the wait. Yeah, I'm going to, there we go. Give up my my quest here because it's beginning to. Tree elves. Oh man, this is. I, I don't believe I'm recording this stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see a lot of people watching this video and, and pausing it right at that point. <laughs> And it is being recorded. Hang on. I, uh. oh, then and now, not old and new. All right, you ready? <laughs> All right. So I was once sitting in your chair. Uh, I started out as a computer engineer, and I didn't want to do the math, so I switched my major to music. So my undergraduate degree is in music. Um, but I, I, was, I was always a computer nerd, and, and right out of college, I did get a programming job, and I spent the next dozen years programming in industry. It was after that point that I went back to school, and I got a master's in computer science, and then a PhD, and, and my degree reads computational bioscience, which is essentially applying computer science and mathematics to problems in molecular biology. 
And so it was with that career change and what was probably nearly 10 years of going back to school to get the master's and the PhD that I switched careers and I decided to, to do the academic thing. And so I got hired here on the tenure track in fall of 2012. So I'm an assistant professor right now. Uh, so that's my story. And all through my professional career, uh, I was a, either an applications programmer and later a manager and an, or an executive of small companies during the dot-com boom. Um, and uh, all along, it's always been in a Unix and Linux environment, so I'm not very proficient at Windows at all. When I was an expert in Windows, there wasn't a Windows. There was a version of DOS. Um, and then uh, the, the Mac, the Apple products, nowadays I gravitate to because it actually has Unix under the hood. So as you can see, it's easy for me to, to get to a, a comforting command prompt. So anyway, that's my story. Um, <laughs> I wasted too much of your time with that whole thing. Uh, what? What? Give me. Give, give me some questions. Anything else about functions, parameters, variables, curly braces, semicolons, colons, all of the punctuation. Yes. When you have a loop and then it's asking for an integer, um, the variable's an integer. How do you? How do you fix it so the loop doesn't infinite loop when uh, the user enters in a character that's like a letter? Ah, so you want, okay, okay, <clears throat> right. Uh, so what do we got going here? So we will call this uh, in, uh, input validation. CPP. So that... <laughs> okay, to do dot text. How did you do that? Yeah. So much code instantly <laughs> in them thing. All right. Whoops. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a different thing. All right. So just keep the questions coming. I'll, I'll stack them up. <laughs> Uh, so let me see, if I can recreate the situation, uh, I'll create a do loop while, and we're going to want something there, and so what I want to do is I want to get a number from the user, and uh, so I want to say see out, uh, how old are you, how's this? And then I will see in into choice. And I want to keep asking this question over and over again as long as choice is less than five. So I, I'm suspicious if they say they're four years old. And if they tell me that they're older than like, you know, once you reach 40, you're too old to use computers. So obviously they're lying, right? So I'm going to keep asking this question until they give me a number between 6 and 39. And let's try using this correctly. How old am I? I'm 4. How old am I? Oops. As long as it's, oh, uh, excuse me, or. I want to keep asking the question if they give me a choice that's less than 5 or they give me a choice that's greater than 40. And I should probably, I changed up what I was going to do here midway, so let me change the. Uh, <laughs> What's that? So many characters all right, whoops, the wrong one. Uh, what did I call it to do? All right. What was that? How did you place files so quickly? How did you replace all of those so quickly? All right, Did that capture it? Were there any others in there? What are your other tricks? Uh, what else do you have up your sleeve? Uh, that one's... <laughs> <coughs> so, what, 
so I, I'm, uh, if I run out of questions, I'll go to this, but hopefully you all will uh, see. Uh, keep me going with some more specific questions. All right, so let me try that. If they give me an age that's less than 5 or greater than 40, then I want to ask the question again. I'll compile it. Uh, I'll run it. How old am I? 4. I'm 90. I'm negative 4. I am 32. And voila. Okay, success. So the problem comes when I run this and I type in the letter A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you? All right. Oh, they didn't finish that. And now I've lost control of the situation. So yes. Uh, that'll answer right now. So when I when I run this and I, I've lost control, all you have to do is a control C. Just hold down the control, hit a C, and that'll break you out. So you can see evidence of that right there. Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you have an end line after your CM? Uh, good question. Why do I not have an end line? Uh, it's one of visual preference. So there's no syntactic difference. Either would be correct as far as the program running. So let me let me do let me put the end line in there and compile it and run it. Note where my cursor is. So if I remove the end line, for me personally, it's more visually appealing. Uh, to not have the end line when I know I'm going to have a CN afterward because it appears to be more aesthetically pleasing for the prompt. Uh, also note that there's a space right here so that when I type in the three, it isn't butted up against a question mark. That was also a conscious decision on my part. I put a space right there. Okay. Yeah? Um, what if you wanted them to enter in a letter instead of a number? Uh, Right. If I did want them to enter a letter, it'd be it'd be I put. Uh, uh, that's my problem. Got it. Yeah. All right. Uh, but the original question was, what if your intention is to get a number from the user and they enter a letter, which suddenly puts it in uh, panic mode, essentially. So what? <clears throat> what you? Uh, so note what you're you're including here. Okay. This allows you to use the input and output put facilities of C++, so that's where the I.O. comes from. And stream is a word that's chosen uh, very specifically. So when we're accustomed to thinking of input and output, we're accustomed to thinking it in discrete things that we enter. I'm going to enter an age, I hit return, maybe I have to enter my name, I hit return. Uh, but in fact, the way the language or the program is considering your input as is it a single stream of characters. So when I, and, and let me illustrate that, let me sidetrack just a moment and illustrate that with output. So um, what you're accustomed to seeing are when I type stuff like this, right, and I put it on separate lines and I do the ENDL, maybe I get fancy and I, I put an age in here. Uh, but we're, we're very much thinking of this output as being kind of discrete chunks. In fact, the way the C out, the way the output facility of C++ is considering this is, is a single stream of characters, which means how it visualizes it is how old are you, question mark, a space. Then there's a new line character. I'm going to put this in quotes so I don't get the weird highlighting here. Uh, then there's a new line character, that's the ENDL, then FDSA, FDSA, then an age, let's just say it's five, and then another ENDL, and then an FDSA, FDSA, and then another new line. So that, that's something that you need to start thinking about input and output as, is just a single stream of characters. Okay? And in fact, when you realize it is a single stream of characters, then this, become, this kind of construct becomes a lot less intimidating or confusing to see. Um, oops, I don't need that. So now this is all just one C out statement. How old are you? Here's an end line. Here's some more text. Here's a variable, another end line, more literal text, and another end line. Right? All right. Uh, let me go back to the original version.
uh, so that it works the exact same way with input. So when I put in an age here, uh, the way the input facility is looking at this is not as me entering a number, it's looking as the character 2, the character 3, or whatever number I enter, and then I'm having to hit the enter key. So I'd represent that as a, as a new line character actually being entered. <coughs> okay. Uh, let, me, let me actually uh, do two inputs. So let me say uh, height, maybe. Just to further illustrate this, I'm going to comment out that little bit right there. I'll come back to that. So when you have to enter two numbers, I... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if it was the other question, you'd probably just stare at the keyboard and wouldn't enter anything. <laughs> so, so now uh, you're accustomed to, again, thinking of this as discrete inputs. And when I... I compile this and I run it. How old am I? I'm 32. How tall am I? 56 inches or whatever the number is, right? But in fact, I can actually treat this as a stream. I am 32 years old and I'm 56 inches high. Okay, so what happened there was that if I look at this as my input stream, I entered a 23 then I entered a space, then I entered 56, and then I hit the enter key, right? All of that happened while I was sitting on line 10, while it was waiting for me to, to enter something. So when it was, uh, once I hit the enter key, then that basically caused my application to take over and for CN to start processing my input. And what it does is it, it actually it ignores all white space characters, white space being a space, a tab or a new line and it'll ignore all of that until it sees a digit or it sees a plus or it sees a minus right because those are all legal characters for for an integer and in fact just to illustrate this bit right here um, what I'll do is let me put a C out statement just so that we can see some of this stuff uh, I'll say age colon and I'll output age and then I'll copy paste. I'll say this is height, and I'll put height. Okay, so let me just run this the way I normally would to confirm that my code is working as I expect. This is something else you need to be doing. Just as a general axiom, this is a whole nother discussion. But when you're developing programs, the problem that I see over and over again is you're not quite sure how to do it. And what you end up doing is writing 50 lines of code before you quit out of your editor and compile it for the first time. Don't do that. Okay, write three lines of code, five lines of code, then quit out and compile. You should be building everything in very small steps. I've been doing this for decades, and yet even now I'm going to compile it and make sure that what I put in works before I continue. Because what if something goes wrong? then it had to be in those three or five lines that you added, right? Makes it a lot easier to figure out where your problem is. All right. So how old am I? 32, I'm 56, and there it is. Okay, so it's working as expected. Let me rerun it again. I'm going to put a bunch of spaces, put a couple tabs in here, and then I'll say 32. I'll put more spaces, a couple more tabs, 56. I'll put some more spaces, and I'll hit return. Okay. So let me go back to how this input is being processed. Again, it's being perceived as a stream, and when you're asked to enter a number, it will ignore all of the white space till it finds a legal integer character, either a digit or the plus or the minus. Now it starts processing the integer, and it will keep reading it in until it hits a non-integer character. And once it hits a non-integer character, it's done. So given my little example right here, maybe I'll, I'll put a few more spaces here, is on line 10, it gobbles up, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, oh, I can't do that, 1, that's 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that's the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, that'd be the 20th character. So if I, in this example, if I entered 20 characters, then on line 11, it's going to gobble up 
characters one through seven, characters eight and nine are going to be read in and interpreted and shoved into age. It will have stopped reading when it sees the space. And so actually, it'll say, then ask, how tall are you? Now when it's Hyde's turn, the first thing Hyde is going to do is it's going to gobble up character 20. And then it's going to read in the 5 to 6. It immediately sees another non-digit. So it's going to stop reading at that point. And when my program quits, characters 23 through 30 are actually still waiting to be read in. And those are never read in. So this is what I mean by the semantic of input and output being considered a stream is a very apt and, and uh, valid kind of analogy for thinking about this stuff. So let's talk about uh, what is going wrong when you enter a character. <clears throat> the same rules apply. Let me just throw in a, a D, a E. How about an E? It Again, it gobbles up all the white space. It hits this character, and it is not a legal character. Now, what happens to CN is it goes into what, it, what I'll call a safe state. It immediately blocks its ears and goes la, 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 and it stops listening to you. It curls up into a fetal position. Nothing you can do at that. It ignores everything. So that means that if I do that, if I entered all this stuff, uh, and I typed E23 space 56, da, 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 da. what would happen is that it would gobble up all the spaces. It hits the letter E, and CN doesn't like it. It immediately curls up into a ball, and you go to the next line. Now note that what is waiting to be read in is character 7, meaning that E. That's how far along in the stream I am. I hit here. CN is already in a safe state. It is not doing anything, so it totally basically skips this line as a way of thinking about it. And it's still waiting for the E to be read in. This while is going to fail, so I come back up to the top. It says, how old are you? It asks for the age. CN is in a safe state. It's oblivious to the world, so the E is still sitting there, and I go forever. Okay, so that's what's happening when you enter a letter. I, I've just spiced it up a little bit by prepending it with the spaces. Uh, but that's what happens when you enter a letter. So the first question is, how do you get CN out of a safe state? Right? You come up on it quietly so you don't scare it and, and say it'll be okay. And the way you do that is by saying, uh, excuse me, that, that, that's, a, that's a question you can ask. You can ask the question, are you good? And what it'll say is no. <laughs> uh, we can test that. Let's actually test that. So let me say C out. No. All right. <coughs> so let's try that. Whoops. What did I do? Don't okay, get that caps lock down. That is the enemy of M. <coughs> so let's compile that. Let's run it. And I'll, I'll do that. I'll kind of make it look like what I did there on the example. And then here's my E. I'll type in the 23. And then I guess I had a 56. Mm, let me see. Hang on. It's not doing something I don't want. So it's saying it's still good. That's not right. That isn't good. Oh! Because it's not good, right? It was false, so it never did that. How do I negate this? Huh? Are you put an exclamation mark? Yeah, you, you, yeah, there is another question you can ask bad. Are you bad in a bad way? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm accustomed to using good, so what I'll do is negate that logic. So cn.good is going to say no, I'm not good. And then I use the exclamation point to reverse it, and that makes that whole expression true. So now, to read it out in uh, English prose, if you are not in a good way, say so. Okay, fair enough. Let's compile it. Let's run it. There's my spaces and tabs. There's my E32, a few more, 56. I hit return. And now you can see that in fact, no, that's right, uh, but you can see indeed that it's not in a safe state. So how you get it in a safe state again, or not, uh, how you get it in a good state again, excuse me, is I'm going to, s is this, <coughs> I'll put a comment here. Another thing I'll do is I will, uh, 
all this code that I'm writing, I'll make sure that David makes it available for you. So if you don't feel like scribbling all this down, um, then you can just simply grab the note, the code afterward. Does David record his lectures? Okay. Uh, one another tip I'll give you is uh, another way of taking notes since I'm recording this lecture is rather than scribbling like crazy uh, the things that are interesting to you. All you got to do is note what time it is. So if I say something really interesting, like I like to play chess, and you go, "Oh, that isn't. I need to hear that again." Just write down two thirty, and then when you get a link to the YouTube video, you don't have to watch. 75 minutes of me, you can just scroll that slider to the 230 mark and listen to that 30 or 60 seconds that was interesting to you. Okay? All right. Um, let's see here. Where am I? Okay, so this will uh, make CN good again. And the reason for the word clear is that there are basically internal states or internal flags that are being tripped. Uh, so what this is what this is doing is CN is able to answer this question because it's looking within itself and it's seeing that there's a flag that's been tripped. Um, uh, you, you all have dealt with booleans, yeah? So there's some bull, internal boolean variable that's been made true, right? And all it's doing is saying that this boolean has been made true, so I'm not good anymore, kind of thing. Clear resets those flags back to false or whatever the original settings are. So that's why they call it clear. Clear the flags, clear the decks, make everything good again. Is this going to solve our problems? Let's see. So what I should get, what you, one in way of interpreting this is uh, I'm going to get the age. It's going to not be happy with that letter E. We're going to be confirming that. It'll say no, but then we're going to make it all good again, right? Then we're ready to rock and roll again with height here. Yeah? All right, let, let's see if that works. Compile, run, and I'm just going to enter. Uh, I'll just do that I won't, uh, so that it won't. we don't have to worry about the other stuff. It's still going forever. Now the question is, why is that? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Because once it hits an illegal character, it doesn't gobble that character up, right? It, it is as soon as it sees that letter E that it immediately curls up into the, the safe state. And that E is still sitting on that stream rate, waiting to be read in. So, I mean, we're actually being, to just say it the way it is, we're being jerks, right? Because, because we scared it here. We're saying, oh, don't worry. It's fine. Oh, okay. Ah! Right? And then you come back up here. Ah! And then, no, no, no. I was just kidding that first time. It'll be fine. And then you, it hits here. And right? And that's what's happening. Okay? You, you, I wouldn't make a good parent. So, um, so what we need to do is we need to do two things. We not only need to clear this flag... But now we need to somehow get rid of this E so it stops being offensive to us, or offensive to CN. So there's another command that you can give with CN called ignore. <clears throat> and what that does is that literally just gobbles up the next character on the stream. So let's see if that works. And note that you uh, you need to do you need to get the order right because right here it's not listening to you. It's still in the safe state. It's when you hit this next line that it actually causes CN to wake up and listen to you again. So make sure you clear the flags before you do anything else. Yes. Uh, not need curly braces for the if statement. So the the syntax for an, an if statement is if condition statement and then optionally you can have an else statement and make it look like that <clears throat> okay 
so that, that's the general syntax for an if or an if else should you decide to do that. But now there is a different uh, concept in the language, which is anywhere, pretty much anywhere you can put a single statement in the language, you can also put curly braces in as many statements as you want. So let me give you an example of that. So we're getting sidetracked. That's fine. I'll, I'll get back to it in a minute. I'll comment this out. Um, so that second thing, anywhere I can put a statement, I can put a curly brace and a bunch of statements. A bunch of statements and curly braces. So right here, why not? That works. I'll compile. I just threw them in there, right? Anywhere you can put a single statement, and there it is running. You're allowed to put curly braces, and you can have one or more statements in the curly braces. Okay. Uh, or you can do this. Now you may say, well, Todd, that doesn't look tremendously useful, and I agree with you completely. Whoops. That is not very useful at all. I'm just showing that you can do it. Where it becomes useful is up here. Because what if you want more than one statement under this if condition? Then the way you would structure it instead is you'd say if condition curly brace. If I need more than one thing to happen in here, then I would use curly braces. Okay, So that's the deal with the curly braces. Uh, a lot of and now David may have promoted it this way, and he would have been uh, good to do so. Is that uh, some people promote always putting curly braces after an if, otherwise you run into bugs, and absolutely you definitely run into bugs because if I do this, um, if uh, if my house is on fire. Then what I want to do is I want to pick up the phone. Uh, no, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. Pick up. Uh, no, let me think of a different one. This isn't going to work the way I want it to. Um, if uh, if my house is for sale, for sale, then collect money from the buyer and give him or her the house. Okay? There's a bug in my logic because you look at this and the way I've written it, I've got them nicely indented. When your eyeballs scroll down here, you go, aha, okay, if my house is for sale, I'm going to get a bunch of money from the buyer and then give him or her the house. But it only works on a single statement. So the way it, I should have indented this is like this. Is This is the only thing under the if statement, and this happens 100% of the time. So if my house isn't for sale, I'm not going to do this, but I'm going to give my house away, right? So, that, so this gets back to what I'm saying. Is some people promote always, always, always using curly braces so that you don't accidentally run into bugs like that. Yes? Can you do multiple statements on one line if you I <clears throat> uh, can you and the reason I'm repeating it back is for the sake of the recording so the question is uh, can you get around the use of the curly braces by doing something like this and putting multiple statements on one line uh, the answer is no as far as the C++ compiler is concerned it, it really is very very flexible about spacing and just about anything spacing wise is legitimate so the compiler is not swayed by doing this. Whether I do this or this or this, the compiler doesn't care about spaces predominantly. All of them are exactly the same. In fact, the compiler acts a lot like CN. It just skips all the spaces. So whether I have one space or separate lines, the compiler doesn't care. It doesn't make a difference to the compiler. In fact, here where I have int main, I could do this. That will compile just fine. It's really flexible with spacing. Okay. Uh, so let me do this, and I'll call this bad. And whoops. And I guess I'll do that for posterity. All right. So I got getting far afield. What I'll do is. 
I'll create another file for this. So I'll say lines 5 through 16. I want to write to a file called if statements dot, I guess I'll do it CPP so I get the syntax coloring. So now you go, oh, I haven't seen that in write down 239. Yes? All right. Uh, now I can delete that. Mm, I'll delete that. There we go. Deleted those lines. I can confirm it's there. There's my if statements. In fact, now that I'm here, I'll take off these comments. All right. Uh, maybe I'll leave the comments around. I'll do that. So, getting back here, uh, we are at this bit here where we need to ignore. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is, it's a little bit confusing to have the two inputs, so to illustrate that this now works, I'm going to comment out the height stuff. So now I'm back to asking how old you are, getting an age, it'll freak out, I tell it everything's all right, and then I said, look, we'll just, we'll just get rid of that nasty E that you're typing in. And now I'll loop back up, and it should, with any luck, then take the number that I type in. So let me compile it. I run it. How old are you? There's, I'll put the spaces just for old time's sake. Uh, the E, then the 32. Okay. So C and freaked out. I cleared the flags. I ignored the letter E, and now it looped back up, asked for the age again, and that 32 is still sitting in the input stream and a, a new line where I hit return. We're waiting to be read in. It reads in the 32, and life is good. Uh, one of the problems is that, <clears throat> uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. So that, that's one strategy to deal with that. Uh, more generally, if you go to Firefox and you type Todd Gibson, it doesn't matter if it's upcase, uh, C++ IO tips. And there you go. All right. It worked in rehearsal, as they say in show business. This way. Uh, come on. Let's, let's try this from the top. There we go. Google. C++, uh, I guess uh, Todd Gibson, C++, I.O. tips. Probably you can just say, uh, my guess, let me see if I can simplify it, I.O. T Todd Gibson, I.O. Uh, second one. No, that's pointers. Well, that's fine, I'll show you. So if I click on this up here, August Council, it, this link here. And then I've got something on pointers, arrays, tips and tricks for using C++ I.O. So there, there's a little bit more to that uh, discussion, but I'll leave it to you to, to kind of dig into this reference here. Okay. All right. So that answers that question, I think. That takes us to our to-do list. Before I get into Vim, does anyone else have any other C++ questions? No? no? Yes? When you read and ignore it, uh -huh. they didn't complete that program? Uh, let me go back there. Input. So... Like it skipped the honor. Yeah, I, I, commented, you, I commented the height stuff out just oh. to make it easier. It'd get a little confusing because I would have typed E32. 56, and what would happen is the E would get ignored here, the 32 would go into height, I would loop back up, and then the 56 would go into age, and they would ask me my height. And the logic would have just gotten a little bit confusing, and rather than me explaining it like I am now, I was just going to kind of say, hey, comment this out, and it's easy. <clears throat> Anything else in C++ at the moment? All right. So, Vim, 
How did I do that? So much code instantly and then thing. <clears throat> uh, let me let me start with a little bit more of a, a general explanation, a, a discussion about Vim, and then I'll get into some of the specifics, including those items there. Uh, let's see. Let's copy input validation to sandbox. How about Vim sandbox? Just so I have something I can play with. All right. Uh, Vim has how to look at it conceptually is I say um, well, let me come up with the pattern first let me see all right here here's the key thing for you to get really good at Vim you need to realize this sequence here a number a command a number a movement <clears throat> What is the example of a movement? Uh, the ones that we all know and love are the J, the K, the L, and the H for down, up, uh, right, and left. Uh, commands are things like, so the examples of movement, Actually, what I should do, since I'm starting generically, before I actually start modifying my play file here, let me call this uh, Vim Cheat Sheet. Right. So these are examples of movement, examples of commands, D for delete, C for change, I for insert, um, I guess X for delete a character, so and then this need not all occur as a sequence of and then examples of numbers 3, 32, right? Or, uh, that's what I mean by the pound sign, actual numbers that you type in. Not all four of these need to occur together. So, for instance, I can do a command and a movement without any numbers, or I can do a number and a movement without any command. So let me give you an example of a number and a movement. I know that L moves me one character to the right. If I type 5L, I immediately move five characters to the right. Okay, so you see how that fits together? Uh, D deletes, so the question is, if I'm on the LE of examples, if I do DL for a command and a movement, I do DL, I'm deleting one character to the right. Now, I don't personally do that much. I'm just trying to show the consistency of kind of the philosophy here. If I do, uh, let me start on the very beginning. If I do 3DL, I delete five characters to the right, or excuse me, <laughs> excuse my math. If I do three DL, I delete three characters to the right, or did I do five? What did I do? Um, so you're able to combine these in different ways. So DL would be to delete one character to right. Three DL would be to delete three characters to right. Uh, 3D3L would be to delete... Anyone? I want to delete three characters to the right, to the right three times. Yep. So let's try that. 3D... 3L, nine characters. Okay. Again, I'm just trying to show you the consistency of this. And, and it isn't very frequent. I, I don't think I've ever done this before. Um, but I'm just showing you, you can combine them. What you normally do is some subset like this or uh, 3DL, something like that. 
Now, once you understand that this is the way Vim's put together, what becomes a lot more interesting to you then is this part of the whole formula, which is the movement. Because anything that moves the cursor, if your cursor moves from one point in the file to another point in the file, that is a movement. So let me see. Does anyone have any movements that they've learned other than the, the four obvious ones, the H, J, K, and L? Say that again? End or home. End or home. Uh, what, is a keystroke? How do, you, how do you go to the end of the file? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm kind of old school. I don't. I didn't know there's an end key or a home key. I did, but <coughs> uh, but that single single characters. Yeah. E. What does E do? Let's try E. Goes to the end of a word. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's pretty good. What if I want to get rid of delete nine characters? Then what would I type? If I type DE, that would delete to the end of that word. How do I get rid of three words? Three DE. So three times delete to the end of a word. That did it. Or uh, delete to three ends. How am I undoing it? U for undo. And it's... Uh, uh, nested or recursive or however you want to call it. So for that editing session, if I hold down U, it's going to delete until I hit the very beginning, right? And then to redo is Control R. So U to undo, Control R to redo. Uh, so the one I, the movement I use, so E to, uh, whoops, that would be movement. Where's my examples of movement? <clears throat> I'm going to get rid of the, the four basic ones here. E, move to end of word. Uh, the one that I use most frequently in combinations with deleting and changing things is W, which is move to beginning of word. I actually use them both a fair amount. E, I generally use by itself. W, I generally use in, in combination with some of these commands. So if I want to change uh, delete A, then I would what I would do is I would say 2DW. Two times I want to delete a word. Or if I want to change it to uh, get rid of, then I would say 2CW and hit escape. So that was 2CW. Two times I want to change a word. Let me go back to the beginning. I'll put that up here. Uh, two times I want to delete a word. All right, excuse me, not delete. Uh, change. <clears throat> and what that in essence means, change two words. How do you go to the end of a line? Other than I can hold down L and wait. Uh, but what? Give me. Anyone know the? Anyone know the single character for uh, getting to the end of a line? Other than end, you're not allowed to say end. Uh, shift A is a variant on that because that will get you into insert mode, uh, but at the end of the line, right? Uh, so that to get to the end of a line while you're just staying in command loan mode is the dollar sign. So this is move to end of line. Uh, zero is move to beginning of line. Now I can combine that with this stuff. So if I want to if I want to delete from my current location to the beginning of the line, how would I do that? Delete from my current location to the beginning of the line. D0. D, zero. What if I want to delete from my current location to the end of the line? D, dollar sign. Okay. If 
it, what I generally promote as an axiom is if it's taking you more than three keystrokes to do what you want to do, then you're not doing it right. Okay? And sometimes it'll go to four keystrokes. But I think it, it, as a general principle you should strive for in, in learning Vim is ask yourself, if, am I doing it in three characters? How can I get to the word delete down there, down here? How can I get to the word delete in three keystrokes? Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> but you understand the difference. Other than me hitting J's a bunch of time and L's a bunch of time, right? You can get places really fast once you, you know the movements. Uh, I would. The only other. I don't want to. I, I don't want to be an encyclopedia of Vim movement commands. So I'm just going to give two more that I use very frequently. One is F move forward on top of. char character and its close cousin T move to next to char so let me get here if I type F in the letter N that's going to move my cursor forward on top of the first letter N it sees, F N. Okay, this is this is very good. So when, on the key, three keystroke principle, uh, if I want to get to the word beginning, I'm or even better, the word of, I'm kind of faced with W W W W W or else if you're doing it really slow, or I'm faced with going to the end of the line and then going back two words. Anyone know how to get backwards? Uh, B move backward to beginning of word. Uh, when you, if I know that I need to get to the B in beginning, then I'll do something like FB, and if my eyeballs are good at scanning, I will have seen that B. And I'll say 2FB, move forward on top of the second letter B, right? You're combining those numbers now. Uh, and then the T, note the distinction. Let me use this first B. FB takes me, whoops, FB takes me on top of that B. Its cousin T, TB, takes me up to but not on top of that B. Okay? And so where this becomes uh, useful is when I get into the sandbox type thing, uh, what I will normally do, what you see me do is I did something like uh, I wanted to create this, how tall are you? So how did I go about doing that? How do you, does anyone know how to copy a line? Why, why, two Y's copy a line. So I went why, why, then I pasted it. Now what I want to do is change the phrase how old are you to how tall are you? So I wanted to get, I decided to change the whole quote. So I needed to get on top of that H because that was the first character I wanted to take, change. So I said F, uppercase H, that took me there. Now I wanted to change up to the closed quote. So I said C, T, quote. Now I just said how tall are you? So that's how I'm doing that stuff quickly. So uh, I'll be the first to say that that being asked to learn Vim is being like being asked to lay down so someone can kick you in the teeth. It, it's, <laughs> it's a really big pain in the ass to learn Vim. It's horrible. Uh, but here's the analogy I use. You're asked to learn how to touch type. And you go, oh, man, and you sit there and it's taking you like a minute to type ask a lad, right? Uh, phrase on the home row. When you go, you know, I got my hunt and pet going, I can go ASK space LA space LAD, right? I can do it a lot faster with the hunt and peck. I'm not going to waste my time with this touch typing. But for those who've learned touch typing, you know, as you learn it, you hit a point where suddenly you're blown away the hunt and peck people. 
It's the exact same way with them. You're going to be slower than anyone. You, you have this person sitting next to you with that little visual <laughs> editor, and they're bringing their mouse over, and they're clicking, and, and you're sitting there just trying to figure out how in the world to start inserting in this thing. There will hit a point in your knowledge with them where by the time their hand reaches that mouse, you're already done with the edit. I guarantee it. That will definitely happen. And in this semester, in, in a social setting, just a couple students that I had in 111 a couple years ago said, you know something, you're right. Once you learn them, you never go back. Okay, so I ask you just to take on faith that if you are going to be, some of you are engineers and other majors, and once you get done with 111, you're never going to do this stuff again. Okay, that's fine. For those of you who are computer science majors, stick with Vim. You will end up being faster than those who don't use Vim. All right, uh, so enough of the, the propaganda. Let's see, what else do I have? Oh, and, and so the strategy to learn Vim is take your laundry list of things that I've provided here today. Go out and find Vim tips and tricks, anything, a cheat sheet. Don't try to master it all. Just promise yourself that, I don't know, on Monday I'm going to look at that sheet and I'm going to pick one more thing and I'm going to make sure that I use that thing all week long in my coding. Huh? What? Did I hear something? Uh, I'm sorry. I must have had a vision. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and and that, that's the only way to learn it. It's, it's a screwy editor. The stuff isn't very natural, even though I provided kind of a philosophy of it. They're, it doesn't come naturally, and it's just developing muscle memory. Sometimes I have to sit and think about when I'm asked, what did you just do? I have to pull back and actually think about what I'm doing because I've been doing it so long. My fingers are just doing it automatically. It takes time to build that up. You do have to, and I had to do it, just once a week, sit down and say, okay, I'm going to work on this one this week. And then gradually more of those begin to get memorized into your hands, and you just get faster and faster and faster. Uh, it is literally a... You can get very good at Vim over the course of this semester, and you'll be fine. To really become a, a Vim sensei is literally going to take you years because you're going to get fast and efficient and everything's going good, but you're going to eventually hit a point, you know, where, oh, I need to get a little bit better, or you saw someone doing some really cool stuff, and that's going to bring you back to the material to learn a few more commands. I definitely do not know them all. I still, every semester, someone does something, and I have to say, how'd you do that? All right? So there's a lot to it. Uh, so let me get let me go back to the uh, what is it the to do? How did I switch files so quickly? <clears throat> oh, in so much code. I'll get the um, yeah. Let me let me do one first. How did I do so much code in instantly? What I did was that. All right. All right. So, <clears throat> I'm taking that one to my grave. Next question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when you either change something, if I say CW to change word and I change that to float, the thing that it gobbled up goes into what's referred to as an unnamed buffer. This is a synonymous with your clipboard. Right, you'd copy and paste in the Windows world or whatever, everything goes in a clipboard. The unnamed buffer is the clipboard. So when I do CW, that it goes into the clipboard. In order to paste out whatever's in the clipboard, or what I the terminology I would use is in order to put out the contents of the unnamed buffer, I use P, P for put. Okay, and there it is. And as soon as I do another change, like I delete a word, I say DW then the int goes away. Now age is in the unnamed buffer, and I can go anywhere, and I can do a P, and that unnamed buffer gets put out. So any sort of edit you do that removes characters go into the unnamed buffer. Uh, there are, and this unnamed buffer, uh, actually, let me see. Yeah, let me re-edit that. Okay, so the unnamed buffer is preserved across editing sessions. In addition to the unnamed buffer, there are 26 named buffers. And you can guess what the 26 named buffers correspond to, the letters of the alphabet. So any command that you do that gobbles up characters, you can specify to put it into a named buffer instead. 
So a name, uh, the way you specify named buffer is with double quotes. I guess I need to go to my Vim cheat sheet. Named buffers. Uh, you say double quote letter of alphabet. And then command that gobbles up characters. So again, if I come up here and I say DW, that goes into the unnamed buffer, and I can type P to put it back out. If I say quote, double quote, so hold down the shift key, hit the double quote. You can also, it gives you a little helpful thing on what it's doing here. Choose a letter of the alphabet. Let's choose R for no reason. So here it's double quote R. Now it's waiting for my command to gobble up characters. And I can say DW. Now that word is in the named buffer R. How do I actually spit out the contents of a named buffer? It's just double quote, the letter of the alphabet, and then the command, how do you do, do, do the command to spit out the contents of a buffer? P. So now let me go somewhere else. I'll do double quote, oops, double quote R P. And there it is. So what I did is I, at some point in my distant past, I typed in all I did is I put that in a named buffer and I chose C for code as the mnemonic that's easy for me to remember. So I won't use C, I'll use D. Double quote D. Now the question is, I need a movement that gets me to line 34. Uh, 34 is the end of the file, so the easy way is for me just to get, use the single command to get to the end of the file. Anyone know what that single movement character is? It's an uppercase G. Whoops. I think that went. Double quote C, D, G. There we go. <clears throat> so now I can say double quote C, put, and there it is. And uh, that's preserved across editing sessions, so I have that forever until I replace uh, buffer C with something different. So uppercut G, move to end of file. So that's how I got that stuff so fast. How did you switch files so quickly? When I go into an, uh, the Vim editor, so I'll go into cheat sheet. <clears throat> the way to edit another file is to type a colon E and then the name of the file you want to edit. Now a nice thing about this is it does tab completion. I don't know if you all you are doing that at the command line. Uh, you can do tab completion here. So I want to type VI and I hit tab. It, I'm currently editing Vim cheat sheet. That's not the file I want that begins with VI. I can just keep hitting tab and it'll cycle through all my files that begin with VI. Recall I did colon E, VI, and that's when I hit tab. So there's VI Sam. If I hit tab again, I get back to where I was. So this is showing me all of my files that begin with VI. The one I wanted was sandbox. Once I have it, I hit return. There I am. What's very common when you're editing source code is that you want to jump between two files. So the way I could get back to the file I was is I could go edit them cheat sheet, right, to get back. However, there's a shortcut. The pound key means the file that you were most recently editing. So the file I was most recently editing was the cheat sheet. Now, which was the file I was most recently editing? The, the sandbox, right? Colon E pound. Now the cheat sheet was the most recent. So you see colon E pound becomes a nice way to toggle back and forth between files. So you do, you do things like this. Uh, I'm going to do 5YY, I'm going to yank these five lines, I'm going to change over to this file, and I'm going to put them right there. Right? Nice, easy way to copy and paste between files. Alright, what was that? Yeah. Uh, so that's how I do that. Now I'm going to a third file, so I'll edit to do. Now my 
recent, most recent files are the cheat sheet and the to-do. So there's cheat sheet, there's to-do. So I, it's just a simple toggle that it's enabling. That's how I do that. How did I replace all those so quickly? <clears throat> uh, what I did is I went to the word... How about so... So how give me give me some vim magic here to get to the letter s quickly. OFS. F F to s, yeah. FS. What I did so there there are a number of ways of skinning this cat. Uh let me add, add another examples of movement. I guess this is command. There's a dot. This means do the previous command again. <clears throat> so I get to the so, and what I want to do is delete this word. So to delete a word, I just type DW, the command in the movement, DW. Now I want to go to the next so, so I can manually get there. And the most recent command I did was DW. So if I type a dot, if I type a dot, all right, let me undo that. Um, what if I wanted to change it to howdy, CW, howdy. Now I go down here, dot, dot, okay. Uh, let's step it up a little more. Does anyone know how to do searching in Vim? Simple searches. A simple search is to type a slash and then what you want to search for. What it'll do is it will highlight it. <clears throat> it'll highlight all the matches. And then the way you navigate between the matches is with the letter N for next. I'll go ahead and put this in the cheat sheet in just a moment. So I type N, N, N. You can see it cycles back up to the top. It sends this little message when it hits the bottom and it continues, wraps it back around to the top. So every time I hit N, I hit the next occurrence. So now, putting it all together, if I'm starting over here, I want to search for so. I type CW to change word. I say howdy. Hit escape. N to go to the next one, dot to repeat. N to the next one, dot to repeat. Okay? So let me go ahead and document that. Let me see. What did I do? I did uh, this... Word expression that means search for expression and go to next match and match in search. <clears throat> you can go backwards, go back to previous match and search. That's how I did that. Uh, there, there is a global search and replace, so I can uh, search for all the letters O and replace them with the pound sign. Uh, the way you do glo uh, search and replace is you do a colon, and let me put this in the search and replace. You do a colon, a percent means the entire file. You don't have to do the entire file, so I could say like 13 to 20, that'll replace, do the replacement in this range here. So if you have a function here, maybe you only want to do a search and replace in that range, that's how you do that. That means the entire file. The entire file, I want to search for search, I want to replace with replace, and just add the G. That means globally on the line. You can experiment and see what it does without the G. It's just not as clever about it. Uh, how did you replace all I and what else do you have up your sleeve? I'm sorry, you'll have to wait for the next time because class is over. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you.